You know, I really had studied and went over so many scripture verses. God, what do you want me speaking on tonight? And, and I thought I had it, you know, up to the middle of, well, late last weekend. Well, hi, brother. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's good to see you, man. Blessings to you in Jesus' name, brother. Good to see you. Hallelujah. And this past weekend, it, it, it was changing on me because I just kept getting drawn to something else. I mean, it kept changing on me. And I thought, man, <laughs> well, Lord, we're going to go whatever. You know, when I get there, you know, I've got notes. I've went in probably six or seven different books and, and I've printed. I mean, I've got five or six pages here of stuff that, that I've copied and, and put down. But before I get going here, I want to pray. Just give me... 15, 20 seconds here, let me pray, okay? Father, I come before you and I humble myself. Father God, I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, Father God. Lord, I want to walk into your holy of holies tonight, Father God. Anoint me, Father God, because I need the Holy Ghost to do this, Father God. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Father, I need it, Father God, as the desert needs water, Lord. Lord, be with me, Father God, because I don't want to have a meeting, Father God. I want to have a Holy Ghost-filled meeting, Father, where your word said it's backed up with accompanying signs and miracles, Father God. To you be the glory, Father, tonight for anything that happens in this place, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So often, we're looking... We're looking at that light at the end of the tunnel, and we're traveling to it. And all of a sudden, it just seems like somebody flips that light switch off. You know, it's much like that movie in Indiana Jones when he went in, you know, and he took the sand and weighed out the sand. He jumped across that pit, and he put it on that, on that little podium there, we'll call it rock. And, and he, he waited again, and he took off, and he didn't put enough on there, and that triggered this massive onslaught of events, booby traps that they had for him coming out of there. And just when he thought, you know, he's going to get out of there all right, here comes this great big old stone bowling ball, about 12 foot in diameter, uh, chasing him out of there. You know, and at one point, he thought he had it. And then when he got out to the end, if you remember in the movie, when he got out, he thought he really had it. But what was waiting on him when he come out at the end? The bad guys. Well, thank you, Mr. Jones, for doing that for me and getting that. You know, and, and all that work. And sometimes in our Christian walk, we feel like that. It's like Satan has stolen our goodies that God has given to us. Are you hearing me? One good illustration here I want to read to you right, uh, is that every so often a storm will come. And we'll look up into the blackening sky and say, God, a little light, please. The light came for the disciples. A figure came to them walking on the water. It wasn't what they expected. Perhaps they were looking for angels to descend or heaven to open. We don't know what they were looking for, but one thing is for sure. They weren't looking for Jesus to come walking on the water. And since Jesus came to them in a way they didn't expect, they almost missed seeing the answer to their prayers. And unless we look and listen closely, we risk making the same mistake. God's lights in our dark nights are as numerous as the stars. If only we will look for them. Many years ago, as I sat in church, I heard a, when, when I was out at a church, Joe Johnson preached at years ago. A uh, brother out there that pastored, he was a semi-pastor there, or the, the assistant pastor, and his name was Marty Howard. And he drove a verse in my head that I haven't forgot yet. And it's found in Hosea 4, 6. My people perish for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. God has set an array of events for us to have the most blessed life that we can possibly have through the death of and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. But a lot of times we walk around and we seem like we're in a defeated life. We're saved. Our ticket's punched. We're going to heaven if we die in an automobile accident. Or, if, you know, the rapture was to take place or whatever. If you pass on, your ticket's punched. But we're living a defeated life. Well, brother, what are you trying to say? Well, somehow or another, we got to get past that point. Let me give you a good illustration. <clears throat> We're going to, I'm going to run this parallel to the Old Testament, the old temple. 
in the Old Testament. There were three parts of that. Are you hearing me? There was the outer, outside courts. There was the inner, the holies. And then there was the inner, the holy of holies. That's three parts. Now, God lived in that above the uh, Ark of the Covenant there where the angels were. God's presence was in that. And only once a year could the high priest back then in the Old Testament enter that with blood. He couldn't go in without blood. He had to make a sacrifice and he had to go in pure and holy. And let me tell you, they tied a rope around his foot too, his ankle, when he went in there. Because if he was doing something wrong or if he hadn't made an atonement for his sin, how are you going to get that body out of there? Because let me tell you, nothing evil can walk into the presence of God. So when he walked into his presence... To make an atonement for himself and the people, he come back out. Now, in the, in the holy place, now that was the holy of holies, but in the holy place, the priests would go in and do their regular duties. And then everybody else that was in Israel could walk around and come out to the outside court. So that's three parts. <clears throat> now I want you to look at something here tonight. Your body is three parts. Your, I should say, your being, you, are three parts. You've got this flesh, what you see right now. You see me. You see me using my soulish realm. That's, that's my soul. That is my mind. And I've got an inward part that you cannot see. You cannot. That is where when we ask Jesus Christ into our hearts and we believe in Him, He resides. Are you with me on that? Now, when God comes in and resides in our hearts, you would think, and I, I used to say heart, I need to rephrase myself, into our spiritual man, sometimes we would think that we wouldn't have the battles on our hands. We do, but we do. It's the same way, and if you just hang on with me here, I'm going to show you this parallel, what I'm going to make about the temple in the Old Testament. So, you ask yourself a question, well, I've got God living in my spirit, but I'm fighting this battle in my mind. You know, in the, in the book of James, it says when, when, uh, you know, when, when desire gives way to, to sin, and sin, when it's full-blown, in James 1.15, it brings forth death. So you see, there's a period of time there. It don't happen instantly to where, you know, you give the seed, we'll, we'll give it to the ground of seed bearing is your soulish realm. In other words, what you see with your eyes and what you do and how you think is, is based on mostly everything that comes out of your soulish realm. And those consequences usually come up in your flesh. There's a lot of things in the Bible, the curses in the Bible, that, that, that we think that, you know, just because we got saved. Now hear me out. You get saved, your ticket's punched to heaven. I'm talking about these battles, this these issues that we just have to keep putting up with in our body, there's a reason for them going on. So, you know, as Christ went in and, and what he did, you know, he, he told us he, he, he went into the temple. Let me just, I, instead of just paraphrasing here, let, let me go right here where I've got that printed out. <clears throat> here we go. And Jesus went into the temple of God. Now how, now, how many knows what he just said right there? Do you catch that? I want you to pay attention to this. He went into the temple of what? God. Where's God residing at at that time? Where did I just? In the Holy of Holies. You with me on that? Pay attention. And when Jesus went to the temple of God, he cast out all them that it sold and bought in the temple catch that he cast out some translations say he drove out are you hearing me and overthrew the tables of money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them it is written my house shall be called the house of prayer but you've made it a den of thieves and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them now let's look at this as your body you've got God living in your spirit you hear me but yet you've got this realm of battle going on right here that you're battling. And the Bible says he's given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
So the blessed good things that you do in life by opening or maybe God telling you to shut a door on something is good. But what about the ignorant things or the sinful things we've opened the door with and allowed a demon to come in and slip through the cracks and torment you? Now, I'm using the word oppression here. I'm not using the word possession. Because number one, I just proved to you and showed to you in the Old Testament when God was in there, nothing could go into the Holy of Holies without being pure that it didn't drop dead. God is in here. The Bible says to us what? <clears throat> Anybody who destroys the temple of God, God himself will what? Destroy. So, could it be <clears throat> that Jesus went in and he drove them out? And when he drove them out, what happened? The blind and the lame came in and he healed them. Do you see where I'm going with this? Oh my, somebody help me. Son, this is fire. This is word, guys. Come on. This is a revelation if you will catch this. I'm telling you, God has showed me this. Man, it runs goosebumps up my way down my arms. Let me tell you. It seems like sometimes, now I'm not saying every time. I don't want you to get crazy on me and say, well, Dave thinks everything's demon oppressed or, you know, or something like that. Absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I, I went down the basement last night and I was exercising a little bit and I hit my leg on the side of the, the bench down there and I had a place on my calf down here where I'd injured and I just so happened to hit that spot. Vicky, dead center bullseye where I had that big heavy scab and whop, ripped it right off. That hurt quite a bit. My point being this, my own ignorance, not watching where I was going, caused me to get injured. You're going down the highway and you're texting on your phone instead of watching the road. They might be a good chance you might be eating the side of the road or a semi. You, you hear what I'm saying? Through our own ignorance, sometimes we can open doors. If you'll study your Bible and get into it, there's many places in the Bible where God warns us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about generational curses, about different curses that can come on to you. Drunkenness, fornication, adultery. Those things open doors and allow a demon to come in and, 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 and reside, oppress you. Are you hearing me? And I didn't say possess you. I said oppress you. You've got a battle going on, whether you want to admit it or not. You've got the good over here and the bad over here, and you're hearing words all the time. You've got a battle. That's that soulish round battle. Everybody in here has got that. We've got to learn how to overcome that. So when Jesus came in, and he overturned, and he drove those out and said, "You, as we just read here, you have defiled the temple. Now hear me out. His father... God, Yahweh, is right over here in the temple, but he's yet, he says it's defiled. It's three parts. Hear me out. Nobody went into the Holy of Holies. Same way. There's no demon in hell can come to you. God's grace extends. You might destroy your own flesh or your own mind in the process of it. Hear me out. But he can't take your salvation. When you say, I do, that's it. It's written down. The Bible teaches us your name's written down in the Lamb's book of life. <laughs> You're his child. Whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. So tonight, what I wanted to hit on tonight, you know, it's like not every disease, but sometimes there's a lot of things you have to deal with in your life. Like man, the doctors can't figure it out. You know, it's like I talked to a buddy last weekend. He told me, he says, you know, I witnessed to a man. As a matter of fact, it was his brother he got a witness to, and he witnessed to him for quite a bit on the phone, he told me. And after he got done talking to him and hung up the phone for no reason, for absolutely no reason whatsoever, his back, lower back, locked up on him. And it locked up on him so bad that he had to call an ambulance to come get him and check him out. And he was down in his back for almost two months. He went to the doctor. And they wanted to put him on pain meds and this and that. And he said, I kept hearing this voice in me. You're under attack because you witnessed to your brother. You're under attack. Satan is wanting to sift you like wheat. Just like with what Jesus had told Peter. I'm praying for you, Peter, because Satan wants to come and sift you as wheat. Why? Because Jesus prophesied over him and said, Upon you, this rock, I will build this church. 
So what he told me was is that he took that first pain pill, and he said, man, that messed me up. You know, he said, that really messed me up, and it messed with my mind. Well, he said, I made it up in my mind right then and there that I wasn't going to take another one. All right? Now, I'm not telling you to quit taking your medicine. Not telling you that. <laughs> Doctors got you on blood, mesh, blood, brush, bleh, blood pressure pills, diabetes pills, you know, and all these symptoms that we have and we suffer throughout these bodies. Stay on your medicine until the doctor says, hey, you're healed or you're good to go. Amen. Well, he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm going to quit taking these pills. And he did. And he said he was in a battle and he prayed and prayed and prayed and he just got a release and he got healed. And it took about two months to get there. So, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like, and I told the brother and I was talking to him. I said, uh, Brother Brett came to me about, I don't know, three months ago. I was suffering with plantar fasciitis since April the 1st of last year in a bad kind of way. I mean, for six months, you ask my wife, I get up off the couch. When I get up in the morning, that foot could not go on the ground. It wouldn't go. I couldn't put it on. Man, you talk about hobbling. I mean, I would hobble severely. A lot of you see me kind of hobbling and limping around in here for about six months, but I'd walk around a little bit and it'd loosen up. And Brett came to me one night, and, and he said, uh, Brother, you ever think that Satan's just trying to attack you on that, trying to get you to, you know, to, to give up? To, you know, because, man, it was riding on me heavy. And I mean heavy. I was thinking, man, if this don't quit, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I thought about that, Brett. I kept thinking about it. And it come back to me. And I said, Lord... And then I got to studying on this stuff, what I'm talking to you all about tonight. And I said, man, I come against that in the name of Jesus. If I've opened the door somehow to a stupid way of my own ignorance, God forgive me. Lord, I rebuke this demonic stuff off me. Get off me. I'm a child of the king. I'm a son of the most high. You have no right. Get off me, devil, in Jesus' name. Well, let me tell you, man, that just hit me. Now I'm walking around. I mean, I have gotten so much better. And my foot is still getting better. It's healing. It's healing instead of getting worse. It's healing. You know, much like when we open these doors through our own ignorance, it's, it's much like this. Nobody wants a rat in your house, do you? A rat's a pretty nasty, stinky way to put it about having a rat in your house because ain't nobody wants one of them. Well, if you go outside and just drop your garbage off on the front porch and you leave it there, I'm going to say there's a high chance you're going to have rats. And for long, one's going to get in the house. Are you hearing me on this? There's a high chance if you go around cursing all the time, if you go around getting drunk, God forbid that a Christian should even be doing those things, but much less... How much is God going to stay in there before you pollute the temple enough that His sweet Holy Spirit pulls out? So, you know, God, He wants to bless you. He wants to protect you. There's so many things in this world that, that we have coming against us. Man, TV is a biggie. I mean, you get so much. People want to water down the Word of God. They want to call evil good and good evil. Just turn on your TV and watch a little bit of politics and you'll get about all that you can stand. Are you hearing me? God loves you and He wants to move on your behalf. There's things you deal with in your life that I believe God is going to break tonight if you want them broke off you. You've got a will. God's not going to circump or overtrump your will. He don't want a bunch of puppets that he's going like this with. He wants you to serve him because you love him. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, no, we're not going to. And what did he do with him? Threw him into the fiery furnace. And he even said, if God don't save us, well, then so be it. But we're not going to you know, go to your command and bow. We're not doing it. And they held strong and God delivered them. Even the smallest things in your life, God cares about. 
God moves supernaturally in our lives if we'll learn to get that ear to listen to the inward man. Because I'm going to tell you something. The same spirit that raised God from the dead dwells in you. So that spirit, but somehow we have to learn to tap into that so we can pull it out because it pulled Jesus out of the grave. And it's in us, it's in you, it's in every one of you. But we've got this massive battle right here. And it's a massive one, let me tell you. I fight it all the time. This flesh and my tongue likes to have its way. And when I do the stupid things, I open doors and keep sitting in that ring, <laughs> just socking it out. I did. And God in His mercy works in mighty ways. You know, I'll tell you this little story how God answered just a little prayer of mine. A small prayer, it wasn't much. It, it answered a prayer over a eight or nine dollar mole trap. I had some moles in my yard that were driving me bonkers. So I went and did some studying on them, did some reading. I bought the best ones, and they happened to be about the cheapest ones. They were patented around the 1900 or so, and they're called a Victor Out of Sight Mole Trap. And if you set them right and watch some YouTube videos on them, they're deadly, and they do work. Well, I had them set out, and I set up last fall before winter come in, and I was catching a lot of them, you know, and even got the grandkids fired up about it. I'd go out there and take them and say, come on, let's go check and see if Papa caught any moles. And they, boy, they loved it. They'd go out there and catch them. We pulled a couple up, and I figured, you know, they'd be off running the other way back to the house hollering, me, 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 me. Papa's got a mole. Yuck, gross, you know, but they loved it. I took that mole off that trap and threw it in the woods, man. And but anyway, I laid those traps down. For one week, I searched for that mole trap high and low. I'd get off work. No, not every day. But during that week, there was probably four times over a week or two period that I searched for that dude everywhere I set a trap in that mole in that yard, and I could not find it. I went through my basement. I couldn't tell you at least three times, Jason, looking everywhere. I even looked in the boxes I've still got that I, that I kept the boxes to that maybe I couldn't find them. I went to the yard barn, opened the yard barn up, went through it. Two or three days later, opened the yard barn back up. I go back through the yard barn. I'm looking for it. I go out and look around my tractor. I'm looking everywhere. I look down by the pond. I look on the picnic table. I go back by. I says, why? Well, you ain't seen my mole trap, you know, thinking, okay, I know who the culprit is, you know, here. You know, on the front porch, you know, she's got to have everything here. This has got to be here, and that's got to be there, you know, and this. And, and I'm looking for that mole trap thinking, you know, uh-huh. And she said, no, I didn't touch your mole trap. And I said, okay. So I went around the house again and looked for it everywhere. I couldn't find it. I went back, went underneath my lean-to over there by the yard barn and looked again. This was another day, couldn't find it. I thought, oh, well. I got home from work again, and I thought, it was a nice day. This, now, this was during Christmas break. How many remembers how warm it was during the uh, Christmas week? Them, them little dudes were moving in the ground, let me tell you. So I thought, man, i got to find that. So I went out there. I got right by my yard barn, and I heard this still small voice in me said, it's in that bucket over there. I walked over, and I said, now, Lord, I thought that to myself. I didn't speak it out loud. I just said in my mind, I was communicating with God in the spirit, in my spirit, through my mind, my soulless realm, but not using my tongue to speak. And I said, God, I already looked in that bucket. Well, that's somewhat truth in that. There was a five-gallon bucket, brother, and then I had two other three-gallon buckets stacked on the inside of them. I pulled, I did pull weeks ago that first two and a half, three gallon bucket out and looked and there wasn't nothing in there. And the Lord said, it's down there in the bottom of that bucket. Pull that other bucket out and you'll find your trap. So then I started getting goosebumps on me, man. I went over and I pulled that first bucket up. I pulled that second bucket up, looked in there and there is that mole trap. Did I say mouse trap a minute ago? I meant to say mole trap. But I pulled that out and I went, glory to God. Hallelujah. Little bitty thing like that. And he heard my prayer. He cares and then, you know, sometimes we get in a, in a place where you got a sick kid or you got somebody with cancer and they're interceding for you, you know. And, 
And you know, so that's telling me, I told you the story for one reason. Listen, that was a minute little thing that only cost me eight or nine bucks. It wasn't going to affect my life any at all besides having to buy another one. But God loved me enough, he heard my heart's desire, and he wanted to talk to me and show me, listen, just get in your prayer closet and start listening. And hey, we can start having communication here, and maybe you ain't going to have to, you know, battle the devil because you keep opening doors. Are you hearing me? Christmas Day. Kids were at the house and the grandkids were at the house. Mimi was in the kitchen doing some cooking. Gent had a little step stool, and he wanted to come over there, and he wanted to help Mimi a little bit, so she put him at the end of the counter there. If you've been in my house, you know what I'm talking about. Come up the basement door, and the, and the, uh, the uh, countertop's right there to the right. And he had a step stool. I don't know about that high. And the old fella was just standing there. And I was sitting on the couch. don't remember if I was really reading my Bible or not, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, you need to tell Gent to get down off that that stepping stool because he's he's going to fall and he's going to bite his tongue about halfway off i sit there and stewed on that for about five seconds and my own Corey sitting over here and like i said mimi's in the kitchen and i don't know where eva was she was doing something and i thought to myself again i didn't say it out loud lord i don't want that to happen that's all it did boom he fell instantly Whop, hit the ground and started screaming like a wild banshee Indian son. I thought, oh no. Why didn't you listen? I thought to myself, why didn't you listen? Of course, Mimi went over and picked him up right quick and he turned around and the first thing I wanted to see while he was screaming it was blood pouring out of his mouth and there wasn't no blood. And I said, he'll be fine. He's okay. Well, nobody got what I said when I said that, you know. And they just probably kind of thought the man thing, you know. <laughs> Get up, son. You're all right. You know, dump truck ran over you, but you'll be fine. Get up, shake it off, take a couple aspirins, you'll be fine. You know, <laughs> you know how us men are sometimes. After they all sat down, sat back down and got quiet, I told them what happened. And God's grace, just because of my thought that interacted with my spiritual man. Now, mind you, he told me. Here in just about eight seconds, he's going to fall. And he did. We need to learn to listen to God's Spirit that's on the inside of us. It will save you a lot of trouble. God is so good. He loves you so much. He died for you. I'm telling you, God wants to move on your behalf. He don't want you be. He wants you living. The only way I can come up with it is the abundant life. I don't know how else to say it. Listen to this, guys. The presence of the Holy Spirit does not keep demon spirits out. Hear me, or you cut me off here. Keeping doorways closed by the leadership of the Holy Spirit does. I could stand up here tonight, and I know it's 7.33, and I could tell you story after story after story of how God's moved on my behalf since I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior back in the old sanctuary, and how many times He's moved on my behalf and kept me from danger there was another time on an old country road I was coming home about 15 14 years ago I'm gonna guess time frame and uh, well, it was on the frontage road that runs in between Union Town and Crothersville Road and I was coming home and of course you know I'm running I run 60 on it hey I can't handle running 45 on it you know I guess one day I'll probably get a ticket over it but who knows <laughs> <laughs> glad Tracy ain't here tonight <laughs> hi Pam <laughs> but anyway here's my point I was coming home and there was a guy just you know just it's like that old cartoon with Speedy Gonzalez and Slowpoke Rodriguez you know if y'all grew up watching them crazy things you know he was just 
you know, he got Speedy Gonzalez that moves everywhere and Slowpoke Rodriguez that was in front of him, you know, just barely moving, you know, and that's what I kind of felt like, you know, I was behind this dude, and I, man, I got to pass this guy, you know, and he got down about 30 mile an hour. Man, what's going on here? And there was a truck coming this way in this car, and unbeknownst to me, there was a woman right here standing at her uh, driveway getting ready to cross over the road to go to the mailbox. Well, as soon as that big truck went around, I thought, man, I'm going to hammer it. You know, as soon as that big truck comes and gets around, the coast is clear. So I'm going to hammer it and go around that dude. You know, gone. Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, don't do it. Do not pass that vehicle. As soon as that big truck, it was a tandem truck, went by, that lady didn't see this other car coming that I was getting ready to pass. She started out on that road. Now, you know where I would have been if I hadn't heard that voice of God? She'd have been on my front bumper, and I'd been about 50 miles an hour, and it'd have been a mess. Perfect timing. I added it up in my head. If I'd have went around and tromped it as soon as that truck went around, it'd been boom. We have to learn. I could go on and tell you story after story how through God's grace that he's kept me. Tonight, I'm not sure how to close this out or finish this up here tonight, but I, I hope I've stirred you on the inside. I hope I've stirred you that, that there are gifts of the Spirit. Sunday morning when we was in here praying, uh, God just, the Holy Ghost hit me, and, and I went from my prayer language to a language I've never spoken before. I don't know what it was, but as I spoke it, everybody knew instantly that there was a gift of the Spirit being used at the moment, and they kind of got quiet. And, and it moved on me so much, I started shaking, and I, and I literally, to, I had to make myself quit weeping to finish what God had put in my spirit to say. And I was speaking in tongues. And I know this tongue was to be interpreted. There's tongues, let me, are you hearing me out? There's tongues you pray to build. Jude says what? To pray in the Holy Ghost always keep yourself built up in the faith in the book of Jude. So that's what you need to do. You need to pray in the Holy Spirit constantly. Keep yourself built up. Amen. Communication, 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 communication. How many knows our wives tell us that all the time? Communication, communication, communication is the key. We have to communicate. Yeah. Yeah, yours too, huh? <laughs> That's good. That's what God called us to do. We're supposed to communicate. I kind of laugh and giggle about it now, but it might not be so funny at the time, you know. But, <laughs> but God moves in a miraculous way in our lives, you know, for us to communicate. And we have to learn to listen to His voice. And... Communication is what God wants to do with us in our prayer closet. If you're not communicating, if you don't communicate with your wife, never communicate with her. Never. If you quit, before you know it, I've known people that's been married and they're sleeping in separate beds, and before you know it, they're sleeping in different rooms, and before you know it, they're divorced. Satan don't come at you all at once. He knows you're wise enough to pick up on it. It's them little pecks that he'll get you with. Getting you to follow, getting you to, to give in, getting to you to, to listen to those doctrines of demons, those lies. So I encourage you here tonight, if you've had a problem in your body that you just can't seem to deal with, the doctors have said, we don't know what's wrong with you. Well, it just could be you've opened the door for something to jump on you. Now, you're saved. You're God-fearing. But you, you're oppressed. I believe God can break that off you tonight. I don't only believe it, I know it. You can't convince me any different. I've seen it in action. I've been to people's houses and prayed over them. There's two different houses I've been involved with, the brother Phil and my wife. Maybe one house with my wife on that, but two with Phil and one with my wife. Where we're we dealing with demonic activity in a home. And one person that I went into their home, they were so scared, they would not. I'm saying, will not, 100% go in that basement, because there's something down there. 
me and Phil went in that basement, walked down there, and man, I could feel it. I could still right now, my hair on my arms were standing up on end. I looked at Phil, and I said, man, there's been some heavy-duty wicked witchcraft going down here when this place was bought to the prior people who owned it. I said, what I feel in my spirits, there's been some kind of seance, and they've been using Ouija boards down here, and they've opened up a dark porthole, and there's demons that are in here. Phil all of a sudden told me he could hear drums, like old drums, like you watch one of them old African movies with Tarzan in it, you know, in the jungle, you know, one of them old ones with old Johnny Wise Mueller in it. You know what I'm talking about, some of you guys of my age. Well, me and Phil, that's old, that's right. <laughs> well, me and Phil started praying, and we were, we were battling, we were praying. And I said, Phil, I know this is the craziest thing in the world, brother. And I know a spirit ain't stuck to a wall. He can, they can just go right through walls. They can go, they're not limited to the physical abilities that we have. And I'm going to give you an interpretation of that tongues I was talking about a while ago. Don't let me forget to say that. If I forget, get off track again. So, Phil, I said, I'm going to go over and open that door. And I know that's crazy. But that's what the Holy Ghost said to do. The Holy Spirit told Jesus, take some mud, make some clay out of it, and rub it in the dude's eye, and he'll be healed. Well, that's crazy, is it not? But obedience... What the Holy Spirit wants. So I went over there and opened that door up. And I said, Phil, run that thing out of here. And son, I could feel that thing go right by me, son, and went out that door. And to this day, every time that girl went down in that basement, not one time did she fear anything. She never had had anybody hold her by the hand and take her down there to the basement ever again. She was free. Now, I'm telling you, this stuff is real. I've been around it. Back to the interpretation. This is how God's putting all this all together here tonight, the Holy Spirit. That tongues I went through, I know it had to be interpreted because it just wasn't my prayer language. God never gave me words to interpret it, but he gave me a picture. Almost like, a, it was, I don't know how else to tell you, it was just a movie picture. I don't know how else to say it. He showed me a picture of a movie, and I interpreted it. And this is what it was. A caterpillar. I saw a caterpillar crawling on the ground in the leaves. And I saw it go up the side of a tree. And then I saw it go out on a branch. And then I saw it all ball up and spin a ball, a cocoon, and lay in that cocoon. And it was dormant for a while. Then all of a sudden, it came out of the cocoon. After it died to itself, he let the Holy Spirit, hello, are you hearing me? Come in and transform. And then this creature is not only limited to the ground and crawling around. Now think about the animals that could attack that creature and eat it. Think about that. That caterpillar. How many creatures? Anything from a possum to a coon, you name it. Coyote. Even one of them moles, I guess, if <laughs> caterpillar got maybe too close in the ground in a hole there but you hear what i'm saying when this caterpillar got transformed it had wings the limitations it physically used to have that would have been impossible to have now was able to fly now the only prey that could really catch it would be a bird or something like that and you see the possibilities. Now, we're not ever going to free ourselves totally of demons that are coming after you. Hello. Jesus had him after him all the time. All the time. They wouldn't quit. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can show us how to shut the doors on these things or take authority over them and get them out of our lives and keep them out. Tell him things in Jesus' name. Get out. Get off my family. Tim Hines told me one day, he says, man, I travel a lot. I go to these different, all kinds of different motels I'm in and hotels and stuff like that. He says, man, I don't know what people have been doing in them rooms. You never know. Man, I get the oil out in Jesus' name and I swap it on that door. 
I go around that room and I know in it and I chase them things out of there. He said, I don't know that sometimes they, they are or not or are in there or are not. If God supernaturally opened your eyes to the demonic world where you could see spiritual demons, most of us it would probably be too scary to even handle. I've only seen one one time with my physical eyes. Well, where was that? <laughs> Hang on to your seats, folks. I was standing right here. It come out, went right around that corner, and went around that wall. It was about this tall, and it looked like a, like a, a, a monkey. That's the best thing I can tell you. A dark figure with a monkey with hair, and it went around that corner and, whoosh, and just disappeared and went right through that wall. Boy, it made my hair stand up. I ain't trying to scare you. I'm trying to tell you these things are real, but I know somebody who's greater. I know somebody that the blood, once you're blood washed, blood bought, rejoice, rejoice. I'm telling you, folks, we can overcome. And God's given you the tools to do it. He's given you the B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. He's given you that Bible, and you need to eat it. You need to get in that New Testament. Yeah, you need to read the Old Testament, too, so you can understand what we come from, from law to grace. But I encourage you, if you're a new baby in Christ, to eat that New Testament. Get in Matthew read the Gospels and go through the Pauline Epistles and then go through James and Jude and Revelation and read this Bible and find out who you are in Christ Jesus. If you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus, you've got no weapons. You've got no battle. You don't know that Psalms 91 verse 10 says, No evil shall befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Chris, put that up on the board for me. Psalms chapter 91, please. Didn't know if I'd use it or not. Start with verse 1, brother. <clears throat> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall have refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Let me tell you what that is. Shield, yeah, go to the next one. Just wait for me. Go to five. Your shield and buckler. Your shield is the hand the soldier would hold right here to keep arrows from coming at him. The buckler is the strap you strap on his forearm to keep anybody from coming at you with a hatchet or a knife or, or whatever they had back then to try to attack you. Look what that just said. Now, in verse five, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day. Folks, them ain't arrows. These are demonic spirits. Next, Chris. Go with me. Nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand by your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you will look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Somebody get happy. I'm telling you what. You've got to get into the word of God. You've got to get into the Word of God, and then verse 10 will come up. No evil shall befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In his hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Go to the next one, Chris. You shall tread up, now check this out. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. And why? Check 14 out. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore, therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. 15. And he shall call upon me and I will what? I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble and I will what? I will deliver him and I will honor him. And then guess what the last verse is there? Whoa, I love that part. 
With long life I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. You've got to get this stuff in you. We fight a battle. Don't ever forget it. Jesus fought the battle and he won. You're going to fight a battle. Sometimes you've got to get a brother to pray for you to help you through. Sometimes you might have to somebody tell you something, you know, hey, that might be some kind of demonic activity going on. Maybe, I, I'm telling you what, I, I, I read books about by, by things, by, by different authors and people that lived this whole life of deliverance over 20 and 30 years, and they found out, like if you've got an alcoholic in your family, and that alcoholic was a, was a grandfather or your dad or your great-grandfather, and he, and he died. When he dies, that alcoholic spirit that's kept him bound up, when he dies, that spirit is going to seek some place to live. And they find out, they, he has found out, that most of the time they go right down the lineage. You ever seen it? Family after family, generation after generation, don't know why, but he was a drunk and he was a drunk and he was a drunk. Get in this word of God and take authority over that thing. It stops here. The buck stops here. I'm going to stand. I'm going to pour this concrete foundation. I'm going to stand on the word of God. His word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh God, keep me, Father. Keep me. David would cry out, God, keep me. If there be any wicked way in me, oh God. I tell you what. Didn't know that this would happen, but if you want prayer in your 